In this video, let's have a look at a tax problem and see how our understanding of elasticities can provide some insights. The problem is this. Suppose a government makes a firm pay some tax for every unit it sells. By now you'll understand that this is essentially a shock to supply. So, the equilibrium price in the market might change. If consumers are then paying more, then they're really the ones who are paying the tax. How large is this effect? It depends on elasticities of demand and supply. Let's get started. When analysing competitive markets, remember from our last lecture that we look at equilibrium prices. Now, these are magic things. An equilibrium price is a price such that the demand for the good equals the supply of the good. Let's now consider the effect of imposing a tax on suppliers. Even if we aim the tax at suppliers directly and we say to suppliers, for every unit you sell, you must pay us some tax, who really ends up paying this tax? If the firm only receives P minus T for each good, which means we're taxing the firm directly for every unit they sell. Well, in that case, how much are they willing to supply when the market price is P? Well, they only receive P minus T for each good. So that's the amount that they will plug into their supply function. That will give them uh, the profit maximizing a quantity to supply to the market when the price is P, they use P minus T in the function. So our equilibrium condition changes. Now, once we introduce this tax, the price uh, that currently exists in the market may no longer be in equilibrium and will only be in equilibrium if uh, the demand equals supply taking into account this tax. So demand, which is a function of price, which may be affected by this tax, uh, will equal the supply uh, from the firm who receive the price but have to pay the tax. Okay, so this is our uh, condition for an equilibrium. Let's move over to paper now and analyze this in more detail to see what we can say about it. Okay, so before we start uh, analyzing this tax problem, uh, I'd just like to go over a kind of basic mathematical idea uh, because it's going to be very important for what we do next. Um, so this is on the difference between an equation, which I'm sure we've all heard of, versus uh, what's called an identity. Okay. Um, so let me just give you an example. So an example of an equation, a very simple one, could be x squared equals 9. Okay, and I, hopefully you can immediately tell me that x is either equal to 3 or x is equal to minus 3. Okay, so this equation implies that x uh, has one of these two values. This is not true for all x, it's true for some specific uh, values of x. So that's what we would call an equation. Okay, now there's lots of things we could do to an equation. We could add the same thing to both sides. We could multiply both sides by um, a positive number or a negative number, and it doesn't change the result. We could take logarithms of both sides, and um, this this wouldn't change the result either. Okay, um, so what about differentiation? Can we differentiate both sides of this equation, and will it still make sense? Well, let's just check. If we differentiate x squared, we get 2x. And if we differentiate um, 9, which is just a number with respect to x, uh, we just get 0. Okay, and of course, 2x does not equal 0, because x is either 3 or minus 3. So differentiating both sides of this equation um, led to, it, it broke the equation. So just remember that if we have an equation, we can't just differentiate both sides of it. However, identities are essentially equations that are true for all x. Um, so let me think of an example. If I said x squared is equal to, and then I said, well, it's equal to x squared, and I could add 4 times x uh, and deduct 4x, okay? Now here, it doesn't matter what value x is. This is just universally true for all values of x, 
Okay, so this is what we mean by an identity. An it's like an equation that's true for all values of x. Sometimes um, they write it, it's written with um, three horizontal lines rather than just two. Uh, but very often it's just written as an equation and then you'll, you'll make an annotation, something like for all x. Okay. Um, and now if we have an identity, let's try differentiating both sides of this. If I differentiate x squared, I get 2x. And if I differentiate this side with respect to x, I get 2x plus 4 minus 4. Okay. And these are still equal to each other. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, message in brief that if we have an equation, something that's true for some specific x, you can't just differentiate both sides of an equation. If you have an identity, so two sides of the of the equal sign are true, um, it holds for all values of x, then we can differentiate both sides of, uh, of an identity. Okay, now let's look at our... Um, our tax problem. We've started with this idea that the demand uh, in equilibrium, let me just write this out. Uh, we've started with this condition. We've said, well, in equilibrium, whatever the tax rate is and the price, if it's an equilibrium, then supply equals demand. Okay. So we're going to treat this as an equilibrium identity. It's always true if we're in equilibrium, okay? So now we're treating this as an identity, like staying within uh, the equilibrium world. Uh, we can differentiate both sides of this uh, and, and, um, and it's perfectly okay to do this, okay? So in this case, we could differentiate the demand with respect to T and the supply with respect to T. Okay, so we're differentiating. How does this demand change as the tax changes? How does supply change as the tax changes? And implicitly we're saying, well, also the price will be changing to maintain this um, equation or this identity uh, so that these two are, this, um, this is still true. Okay, so let's analyze this term a bit more. So here we've got the derivative of demand with respect to tax. So we could uh, notice here we have kind of a function of a function. So demand depends on the price, which implicitly through this equilibrium identity depends on the tax as well. So we could write the change in demand as price changes multiplied by um, the derivative of price with respect to the tax. Okay, so that's simply using the chain rule um, to, sh uh, to know that these two things are equal to each other. What about this side here? Um, well, here we've got P minus T. So I could write this as, um, for example, the derivative of supply with respect to, and then put P minus T here, and then the derivative of P minus T with respect to um, the tax T, okay? And I can clean this up a little bit and write the derivative of P minus T here. And then in brackets, I would have the derivative of price with respect to the tax minus, and then the derivative of the tax with respect to itself, which would just be one, okay? Um, now, in the book, this isn't made entirely clear. Um, so I think the easiest way, way to do the next step is the following, just to say, well, let's consider small taxes. Okay, so we're only going to be talking about small taxes and our equations are only going to be um, approximately true. So P minus T, okay, if the tax is very small, it's very close to... Um, excuse me, it's close to P, okay? In which case we could say, well, for small taxes, this derivative here is approximately equal to this derivative, the derivative of supply with respect to price. Now, um, in the book, he says this is always true. 
when I say always, I mean um, for any tax, any um, however large the tax is. This is always true um, if demand or if supply, apologies, is uh, linear, because there the slope term is constant. For nonlinear supply, it's approximately true, provided that the tax is small. Okay. In which case, uh, so we're going to take it as true and, and say that our result holds for small changes in the uh, small tax levels, in which case we can rewrite our equation, the derivative of demand with respect to price multiplied by the derivative of price with respect to tax is equal to, and then I'm going to replace this term here with the derivative of supply with respect to price minus one. Okay, so this, this is uh, an approximate equation that's a very, very, very good approximation when the tax uh, is, is small, or if supply is linear, then it's, uh, it's exactly true. Okay, so um, from here, what we want to do is essentially get this uh, derivative of the equilibrium price with respect to the tax rate. We want to get that by itself. Okay, um, so if we do some rearranging, Let me just rewrite the where we're up to, the derivative of demand with respect to price multiplied by the derivative of price with respect to tax is equal to approximately the first derivative of the supply function with respect to the um, price multiplied by the derivative of the equilibrium price with respect to tax minus one. Okay, um, now if we do some rearranging here, uh, you can, we essentially want to get this term by itself, okay? Now, I won't go through all the steps, but I encourage you to try it at least one, at least once. You'll find that this derivative here is equal to the derivative of supply with respect to price divided by the derivative of supply with respect to price minus the derivative of demand with respect to price. Okay, so now we've isolated this term, uh, which is precisely what we were hoping to do. I'm going to do one more trick, and that is to say, well, this is this almost looks like an elasticity formula, apart from the fact that we would like to multiply it by p and divide it by q. And if I'm doing this to the top uh, of a fraction, then I should do it to all the terms on the bottom as well. So divide by p divided by q here, and p divided by q here and we get the equation, the derivative of the equilibrium price with respect to the tax rate is equal to price elasticity of demand, to, um, apologies, price elasticity of supply divided by price elasticity of supply minus price elasticity of demand. Okay, now apart from my little scribble in this, hopefully we can look back and see, we can look at this formula and think, what a beautiful formula. Research in economics does not always go quite as well as this. Um, but this is a very nice thing. And we've, through uh, hard work, we've uncovered a kind of very deep connection here. This term here, the derivative of the equilibrium price with respect to the tax rate, that's saying, how does what consumers have to pay change as we increase the tax? So this is called the incidence of the tax. If we could provide a very precise formula and say, well, this incidence of the tax depends on the elasticity of supply for that good and the elasticity of demand for that good. So now we can make very strong predictions. So let me give you a very simple example, e.g., if um, if the elasticity of demand is zero, so that extreme case, remember what we called that perfectly inelastic demand, then the rate at which the equilibrium price changes as the tax rate changes is equal to one, which means every unit of tax we add, we are charging the supplier, every, the entire unit is being passed on to the consumers, okay? So here the, the, um, the strategy of, well, let's try and tax the firms because they have far more resources than consumers completely fails because the equilibrium price simply adjusts um, 
so that all of the tax is is paid by the consumers. Using our knowledge of elasticities, we've derived a formula that describes the change in the equilibrium price when a firm gets taxed. This change in equilibrium price, called the incidence of the tax, essentially tells us how much of the tax is really being paid by consumers. This is really worth knowing for both economic and political reasons. If demand is very inelastic, then taxing firms for every unit they sell is really going to hurt consumers. If demand is very elastic, then firms end up paying most of the tax. So the analysis here really does help clarify our thinking. One thing to point out here is that the very nice formula we obtained, although it required a bit of hard work, really shows the power of studying economics in a mathematical way. I'm not sure how we could have got such a deep and clean result without making use of sophisticated mathematical techniques like calculus. Hopefully this hints at the power of studying economics in a more mathematical way, allowing us to unlock these deep relationships very precisely. See you soon, and in the meantime, take care.